Whether you're doing web scraping, retrieving data from a database, or interacting with an API, knowing about asynchronous operations is crucial. In this video, I'm going to show you how async works and how you can write code that runs in parallel so that your application becomes much more efficient. Before we start, I have something for you. It's a design guide that I wrote that explains the seven steps that I take when I design a new software application. It's available for free at ariamcode.com slash design guide. It contains really practical, actionable stuff you can apply immediately to the code you're working on and improve the way you design your software. So get it for free at ariamcodes.com slash design guide. I've also put this link in the description of the video. Now let's take a look at today's example. The example that I'll be looking at today is an Internet of Things service. There's a simple main file that creates an Internet of Things service object. It then registers a few devices, smart devices like a Hue light, a speaker, and a smart toilet. I don't really want to know what that means, but anyway. So each of these devices gets registered at the service. And then you can run a couple of programs, like there's a wake up program, which switches on the hue light, switches on the speaker, and then plays a song on the speaker. And there's a sleep program that switches off the hue light and the speaker, and then also flushes and cleans the toilet for you, which is really useful. And then we run these programs. There's also a package here, local package called IoT, which contains a couple of classes that we're using here in this main file. Let me actually make this a little bit smaller so you can see it better. There's a devices file that contains the various devices, right? So there's a Hue light device and a smart speaker device and a smart toilet device. And each of these have a couple of methods. So there's connect, disconnect and send message. Send message gets a message type, which is in this file. And message type is basically an enum to switch on or off or change the color of a light or play a song, open and close, etc, etc. And then there's a data class message that contains a device ID for whom the message is intended, the type of message that you like to send, and the string containing some data. And then finally, we have a service, which has a helper function to generate an ID. It uses a protocol to define what it expects when a device is registered in the service. So the device should have a connect, disconnect, and send message method. And the service itself is pretty straightforward. You can register devices, unregister them. It basically keeps track of devices in a dictionary and generates IDs when you register them. And then we have a run program method that takes a list of messages and then sends them to the right device by using this send message method here that looks up the device in the dictionary and then sends the message. So pretty straightforward. Let me run this program and then I can show you what is the output. So you see it gets a couple of connection messages and then when it runs the program, it shows what happens when the message is handled. Now, of course, these are not real smart devices that I'm connecting to. And it's mainly an example to show how asynchronous operations are going to work. The traditional way of dealing with asynchronous and parallel code is by using threads. Whenever you start an application, this actually launches a process. That's the operating system that does that for you. And a process is basically a piece of CPU and memory that you get allocated. Within a process, you can have one or more threads. The operating system schedules how much CPU time each process gets and for how long. So what's the difference between threads and processes? Well, processes really get a separate piece of memory assigned to them, whereas threads can actually share memory. Threads are actually quite useful because often you have to wait for things. For example, when you open a file, you have to wait until the data becomes available or you have to wait for the response of a network. And with threads, this means you can do other things while you wait. Even though threads are quite powerful, there's also a couple of problems with them. One problem is that because they share memory, you easily get race condition bugs where threads try to read and write data at the same time, leading to all kinds of unpredictable behavior and crashes. Another problem is that programs in general become a bit harder to understand if you have multiple threads, because as a developer, you're gonna have to think about what it means when the different threads interact with each other. So that also means that even though you can create a program that is multi-threaded, it doesn't have to mean that in every program you just have to use threads just because you can because they complicate things. And a third issue is they actually introduce some overhead because there is a part of the system that has to manage the threads, stop them, restart them, etc., And that also takes CPU time. There's an alternative to threads and that's called asynchronous programming. This relies on something we call a future or a 
promise or a delay or a deferred. And these things describe a sort of proxy for an object that's at this moment yet unknown and is going to be resolved later in the future. Normally because the computation of that object has not yet been completed. In JavaScript, these things are called promises. In Python, they're called futures. They're not exactly the same. There's a slight difference between them, but they're used in more or less the same way. Now, generally, when you write asynchronous code yourself, whether that's in JavaScript or in Python, you won't very often encounter these objects directly because there are syntax extensions that help you write code that uses them, but you don't have to create these objects yourself. Futures and promises come from functional programming. These terms already appeared in computer science academic papers in the 70s. Actually, Barbara Liskov, whom you might know from the Liskov substitution principle of the solid principles, has played a key role in defining futures and promises and how they should be used. If you want to learn more about the solid design principles, I did a video about that a while ago. You can watch it right here. So now let's change the code in the example to use asynchronous operations instead. Especially in Python 3.10, asynchronous operations have become a lot easier to deal with in your Python programs. When you want to run an asynchronous program, you can use async IO to achieve that very easily. Let's first import async IO and I'll show you what I mean. So that's the async IO package. And now in order to make main asynchronous, the only thing we need to do is write async in front of it. And now main is an asynchronous function. And now there's a problem here because we're not calling it asynchronous. We can run main asynchronously very easily using the asyncio.run function. There we go. Now we have our first asynchronous program. Obviously inside the asynchronous main function, there is nothing that's actually relying on things being asynchronous. So when I run this, I'm getting exactly the same result as before. But now let's turn our devices and our servers into an asynchronous device and service, which makes sense, right? Because if you connect to a device, normally this happens over a network. So you're gonna have to wait for the response for that connection to be successful. So that's a typical asynchronous operation. And what I'm going to do, so in my devices classes, I'm going to turn these connect, disconnect and send message methods into asynchronous methods. So we do that in exactly the same way as for the main function. You just write async in front of it. Let's do that everywhere. There we go. Now each of these devices is asynchronous and let's also add some actual asynchronicity asynchronicity in it by introducing a sleep to simulate a connection delay. So for that, we're going to import async IO because I need the sleep function. And let's add here a async IO dot sleep for half a second. And let's put this everywhere. There we go. Now, whenever we call this method, it's gonna take half a second for the response to come in. And that's gonna affect how we run the programs in our main function. So we have our devices that are now asynchronous. The message part, we don't need to change because this is just a message representation. And the service, we can now also make asynchronous. So instead of expecting a device that has standard Python methods, we can now create a protocol that expects asynchronous methods. And then we can also make the surface itself asynchronous so that these methods are also going to be asynchronous. This one doesn't need to be asynchronous. Running the program does need to be asynchronous and sending the message also needs to be asynchronous. Now see, we're getting a couple of errors here because we're now calling methods inside these send message and run program methods that itself are asynchronous. Like for example, Let's look at registering a device. So there's the connect method, which is asynchronous. So async, what we've written here in front of each of these method names indicates that this method is run asynchronously. We have another keyword that's called await, which tells us that we should wait for that asynchronous method to finish before we continue with the rest of the code. So that's what we can write here. 
So in this asynchronous method, we're waiting until the connect method is finished, and then we're going to do these things. Stay see, it works very differently from threads where we don't have this mechanism at all. But I find this actually a really intuitive way of working with asynchronous operations like database connections or connecting to devices like we're doing here. Same thing for unregistering device. So I should also add an await here. So this waits until the disconnect method is completed and then it's going to run this line of code. And for running a program, I can do the same thing. So I'll write here await in front of this send message call and in send message i have to do the same because this is also an asynchronous method so there we go now everything oh sorry this should be await obviously so there we go now everything here is done asynchronously which is nice and in the main function we can now also call the methods asynchronously so that means that we should put an await in front of the register methods here like so, and running the program is now also asynchronous. So what happens here? Well, we wait one by one until we've finished registering these devices. We define the programs here, and then we run these programs in sequence, and we wait every time until they're finished. And now when I run this, let's save the file and run this, you see that it actually didn't work, and that has actually a very simple reason in that the sleep routine that we're calling here, we should actually also await it. Otherwise, this doesn't work, obviously. So it's actually the exact same reason we need to wait until the sleep function has finished in order to print this message. So now let's try this one more time. And now you see everything is taking half a second. So we're connecting and we're running these two programs and awaiting each result in order. Until now, we didn't do much more than adding a couple of sleep operations and waiting until they're finished. So that doesn't really sound like a big advantage, but let's change the example now to use parallelism. And that's going to take this code to the next level. Now that we've set up an asynchronous program like this, we can start to profit from asynchronous operations. Because when you look at the code, Actually, it's not very efficient. We're waiting here for every device to connect, but actually there's no reason for this to do that because these are independent devices, the hue light and the speaker and the toilet. So we could potentially just send out the connect messages all at once and simply do that at the same time and then just wait for everything to come back again. We don't have to wait for the hue light to register in order to register the speaker. And we don't have to wait for these two things in order to register our smart toilets, which is independent from the hue light and the speaker. So what you can do instead is use a function called gather. That's also part of async IO and that allows you to run things in parallel. So just to show again what's happening at the moment before I change it. So I'm just going to disable running the programs, but you'll see that it waits for every connection to finish in order to connect the next one, right? So that takes about two seconds now, or one and a half seconds. And let's go back up here. And that's because we're calling these await statements one after the other. Now let's set this up slightly differently using asyncio.gather. So this is what that looks like. So gather takes a number of arguments. Each is an async call to a function, right? Registering a device. And it returns a tuple containing the results of those function calls. But the nice thing about gather is that it's actually calling this in parallel. So you remember before we saw this connection happening one after the other. So if you now look at when we run this code, we get an error. Gather itself is again an asynchronous function. So we should write await in front of it. You remember before we saw that connecting to each of these devices happened one after the other. Now let's look what happens when we connect it in parallel. 
So you see, we get immediately three connecting messages. It waits a bit and then we get the connected message back. And this is of course now much faster because all these sleeps, all these uh, waiting for connections things are going to happen in parallel and that just saves a lot of time. So by combining both these sequential and parallel operations in your code, by thinking about what you can do in parallel, you can actually achieve a lot of speed up and a lot of performance improvements. And here it saves a lot of time. It basically saves two thirds of the time because we can wait for all these connections in parallel. We don't have to wait for one in order to connect to the other. And we can do something similar for running programs. So in this case, we have these programs that send messages, right? So we have switching on a speaker and playing a song, etc., flushing and cleaning the toilet, and then we run them. So let me just remove the comments sections here so then we can run these programs again but at the moment if you look at the surface you see that the programs are also running in sequence because they're in a for loop and every time we call a wait so we wait until each of the messages is sent until we send the other one and that results also in a lot of delays so you see, we get every message one by one and it waits until it receives the next one. But that's not necessary because, well, we can switch on the hue light and the speaker at the same time. It doesn't matter, right? One thing you could do is that run program sends the messages in parallel instead of sequentially. And you can do that by replacing the for loop with list comprehension. And that looks like this. So we're calling the gather function. I need to import async IO. And then we're creating a list self dot send message for message in program like so and because gather expects arguments we need to unpack this list as follows and now we can delete these two lines and now run program runs it in parallel so if we go back to the main function let's run this again so you see we get the connection and it's running the programs much, much faster. But this might actually not always be what you want because there's some problems here in that there are dependencies in this program. Like here, I'm switching on the speaker and then I'm playing the song. I have to wait until the speaker is switched on until I can play the song. And here, similarly, I'm flushing the toilet and then I'm cleaning the toilet. I don't want to start cleaning the toilet while I'm flushing it. That's going to be a huge mess, probably. So it's a bit more complicated than that in the sense that we have these programs, but part of the program is is sequential and namely we want to switch on the speaker before we play a song and part of the program is parallel we can switch on the hue light independently from the speaker right so how do we solve this one thing you could do is create a slightly more generic mechanism of running a program and let's create two helper methods here to illustrate what I mean let's say we have a asynchronous function that's called run sequence and what that is going to get is a bunch of functions as arguments. So let's call that functions. And these functions are going to be asynchronous. So they need to have a type which is awaitable. You can use the awaitable type for that. And we don't really care what these functions are going to return. So we just assume that they get any as a result. And then inside this function, well, the sequential version is simply running a for loop. And then we're awaiting the function, right? So this is an awaitable. And let's see, we can add a second function here, which we'll call run parallel. And this is also going to get functions, which are awaitable. And both of these functions return none, like so. And here we're using asyncio.gather. And we simply pass it the functions that we got as an argument to run parallel. So you don't necessarily need to do that, but it's a bit cleaner to set it up in this way. So now what you can do, and I'll do this for the sleep program to show you what I mean. Instead of defining the program like this, where we're simply defining the messages, we could construct a program that consists of awaitables. And then that is the program that's going to be run. So it's not the messages, it's the awaitables. Here's an example of how you could do that. So sleep program, for example, I can translate that into a bunch of awaitables like so. I'll run the function so I'll call the function run parallel. So by default, I'm going to run things in parallel here. And the first thing I'll do is service dot send message, which is an asynchronous function and pass it this message right here. And then I'm going to call the service send message again. And because that's going to happen in parallel, I'm going to send it this message. 
So now these two messages are being sent in parallel. But what's nice is that we run parallel and run sequence, both because they're asynchronous, they're actually also awaitables. So we can nest these things. So what I can do now is have another awaitable here, which is run sequence. And run sequence is going to get a service dot send message. And that's going to flush the toilet for us. And then let's do another one, which is service.send message. And we have cleaning the toilet, like so. This line I can delete. So let's run this program and see what happens. So this is the wake up. So what you see here is that we get three messages that are being sent in parallel to the Hue light, the smart speaker and the smart toilet. They each receive these three messages. And then finally, smart toilet handles another message, type clean, and then also receive that message. So this message here waits until this message is finished. And that's because run sequence runs these things, well, in sequence. So if you look again at this program, we have this awaitable, this awaitable, and this awaitable. And these are all run in parallel. So that's what you see here. So these three are started in parallel and including this sequence, which is started in parallel, which in turn sends this message as the first step. So that's what you see here. So then each of these messages has a delay. So that calls uh, sleep in this case, but normally you wait for the connection to be established or the message to be received. And then we wait until the response, right? That's what happened here. And then once this thing sends the response back of smart toilet receive message, then the run sequence goes to the next thing, which is this. Right. So what you could do now, for example, is add, let's say, another thing here. Let's say once we've cleaned, flushed and cleaned the toilet in order, which is great. We want to switch on the speaker again and play some music because now we're very happy that the toilet is so nice and clean. So what you can do now is let's say we have another run sequence call and there we're going to send a message that the speaker should switch on like so. And then let's also play a song service dot send message like so. So now this is the program we have. These things are run in sequence and you can basically create any hierarchy of parallel and sequential uh, function calls in this way. And that's exactly what the power is of async IO. Now there's a bunch of other stuff you can do with async IO, but this kind of thing already covers, in my case, at least 90% of what I need to do with async IO, just waiting for stuff and being able to run a couple of things in parallel. There's other things you can do as well with async IO, like handling streams asynchronously, dealing with sub processes, queues, etc., etc. I won't dive into that in this video, but there's a lot that's possible. If you're interested in this, I could do a follow up video where I dive more into those details if you like. Let me know in the comments if you want to see that. So I hope you enjoyed this quick introduction to asynchronous operations in Python. If you did, give this video a like. Consider subscribing if you want to watch more of my content. Now you notice that here in the code I'm registering devices at a service and this is all done in the code itself. There is also a way to do it using plugins which allows you to create new devices on the fly without actually changing anything in the main code. If you want to see how that works, check out this video that I did a while ago where I talked about that in detail. Thanks for watching, take care and see you next week.